or if you prefer, in um, South India's engagement with modernity. And I don't think they fucked up that modernity, however one defines it, has gripped the South more intensively than elsewhere in India, nor even that in many senses the South has become the vanguard of modernity in India more generally. Obviously that great symbol of modernity, the IT industry, has its locus in Bangalore, in South India, and its strongest secondary expressions in places like Chennai and Hyderabad, now nicknamed Cyberabad. But the phenomenon goes much further than this. The South is rapidly becoming the principal home of some of India's most technologically advanced industries. For example, autos. Chennai, or more properly one industrial park just outside Chennai, now produces 60% of all of India's auto and auto park exports, one million cars a year. Although given the state of Chennai's roads, how would they ever get out of that industrial park remains a total mystery to me, but nonetheless they are produced there. And it goes beyond matters of technology and economy. For example, the southern states have led the country, in some cases by miles, in the promotion of literacy and education, and also in the decline in female fertility and the emergence of women into prominent positions in, the, in public life, as witnessed the four famous Reggae sisters who now run the global and multi-billion dollar Apollo hospital chain, which has facilities in 58 countries. Well, in this paper, I want to suggest that this position extends no less into politics, where many of those features that we associate with modern India, an active participatory democracy, radical demands for equality, the fulfilment of citizens' rights, the political mobilisation of the lowest castes, claims on the state for advanced welfare provision, and so on, are not only most deeply entrenched in the South, but in many ways began there and have now spread to the rest of the country. I mean, when it first came to prominence at the 1962 general election, the Dravidam and Entrakaragam, DMK, represented virtually the first popular regionalist party to challenge the Congress's initial one-party dominance. But that set a trend which now so many have come to follow subsequently. Equally, caste preservations in South India go back into the late 19th century and now embrace 75% of the total population. Also, of course, it, um, when it was first started in 1982 by the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister M. G. Ramchandran, uh, M. G. R., about whom you're going to hear a lot more uh, this afternoon, the Noonday Meals program, which guaranteed every child in the state at least one meal a day, was just about the most radical welfareist intervention anywhere in non communist Asia. Although now, of course, it's been taken up nationally in most Indian states. In politics as much as elsewhere, the South has been trendsetting, especially in asserting, asserting the rights of the modern citizen to dignity and to basic welfare. Well, part of my project is to explore why the South has pursued these modernist ideas quite so avidly, and with very little of the reservation and angst noticeable in the political discourses and critiques of modernity coming from other parts of India, most notably Bengal. What is there about its society, culture, and history which is oriented towards modernity in this way? That, of course, is only part of the inquiry. <coughs> the other side is what particularly it does with modernity. For, of course, its processes and outcomes are by no means exactly as, as anticipated in Western sociological textbooks, and in some regards might be, not, might be thought of as not proper modernity at all. For a start, the South has been very eclectic in the bits of modernity with which it's prepared to engage. Some ideas, some technologies have been very rapidly and very widely absorbed. Egalitarianism, entrepreneurship, the cinema, IT. Others of them have almost been completely ignored. Individualism, the idea of the state, of the modern state that is, the novel, toilet paper. This eclecticism has also shown itself in the way that different groups in society have been oriented towards different parts of the modernist camp. Parians and the Lowest castes, for example, were drawn very early on towards Protestant forms of Christianity. But Brahmins and upper class rejected these, often violently. However, they themselves were then drawn strongly towards Western science and technology. Besides eclecticism, 
What Southern society has chosen to do with modernity has also been highly idiosyncratic. For example, as Dilip Menon has seen, the arguments of the celebrated 19th century um, atheist Charles Bradlaugh came to be very popular in South India, where they were widely deployed in critiques of Christianity by Hindu polemicists and missionaries, whose purpose was then to fill the vacant space thus created with the truths of their own Hinduism. Atheism here was used as a kind of discourse tool to clear the way for religion, as to say Hinduism, to advance. Equally, the founder of the Dravidian movement, Peria, the great E.V. Ramaswamy Nayaka, espoused very radical ideas of atheism, rationalism, and science, but with the ultimate objective of restoring the Dravidian race to an original and pristine condition of equality and communality, which it was held to have possessed before the Aryan invasions of the very distant past. The ends to which modern ideas and technologies have been put in the South have often not been very modern in themselves. And correspondingly, the outcome of the South's experience of modernity has been no less idiosyncratic and different. And indeed, as I was saying, so idiosyncratic and different that at times it might be thought to raise questions about how we understand the paradigm of modernity at all. For example, if the South's recent experience is anything to go by, it must raise doubts that the progress of science and technology necessarily lead to the disenchantment of religion, as Max Weber put it. In South India, religion and science have marched relentlessly onward, hand in hand. In the last 20 years, as technological modernity has gripped, religion has flourished, and most especially among the most modern middle classes. Over 50% of the South's burgeoning tourist industry, for example, is now devoted to pilgrimages and visits to temples. The earnings of the great Tirupati temple have gone through the roof, $500 million a year at the last count. And Tirupati itself, via the several educational colleges and universities which it endows and sponsors, has become a leading investor in the IT industry. Earlier I mentioned the four Reddy sisters who run the giant uh, global Apollo hospitals chain. In a recent interview, the eldest of them revealed how every summer she goes to visit her children who now live in Knightsbridge and Mayfair in London. And then she goes to Tirupati Temple where she walks around the base of the temple on bare feet in order to thank the Lord Venkateshwara for her good fortune. Many of you would have heard of Vijay Malia, who runs into Alia of the Force One India Formula One team, um, United Breweries, White and Mackay's Whiskey, and the Kingfisher Airline Company. But Malia insists that every new plane that he buys for Kingfisher Airlines is sent to Tirupati Temple to be blessed before it comes into commission. In Bangalore, the global guru, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, has installed the Forbes 500 rich list in his temple as a central object of worship. You do puja for the Forbes 500 rich list. So what's been happening in South India very much puts to test any ideas that we might have that scientific and capitalistic rationality necessarily lead to a secularised version of modernity. So broadly then, what I'm interested in trying to understand is this stunning bricolage represented by South India's modernity. And what I want to talk about in the rest of this paper is just one aspect of that, the political aspect. However, before I get there, just let me respond briefly to <clears throat> what I suspect may be two questions already forming in your minds. What does he mean by South India? And what on earth can he mean by modernity? Well, the first, I think, is rather easier to answer than the second. But my South represents a set of social, historical and cultural traits, rather than a neatly defined geographical entity. I can't go into much detail here, but these qualities include um, a long coastline which has been the focus of transnational trade and migration for centuries. As we'll come back to, remember this place was the centre of, in certain senses, the world economy of the late medieval, early modern world, the workshop of the world for textiles, and, and also uh, had a very major pepper, uh, pepper trade, a spice trade. 
through deeply engaged in commerce for a very, very long time. It also had um, um, a matrix of complex cultural pluralism to a long language, religion, and caste, uh, embedded communitarian forms of right, recognition of temples and other religious institutions as the principal fora of social and cultural interaction. But if I had to put a territorial fence around it, my South would obviously be a peninsula, but with something of a Western bias. It would include Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, Southern Andhra, but also Maharashtra, importantly. But it would exclude Northern Andhra and Orissa, which in these terms belong somewhere else. And as for modernity, now there by hangs a tale and a theoretical literature now so enormous and so complicated that I fear if we ever get into it, we might never get out again. So complicated, in fact, that I'm inclined to adopt Christopher Bailey's cop-out in his book, The Birth of the Modern World, which is to say that whatever it might or might not be, you know it when you see it. But as part of my message of my, in the project, I suppose, is that you don't necessarily know it, or at least in South India, uh, when you, what you see is likely to be as old as it is new, and the pre-modern, modern and post-modern have a habit of collapsing into each other, I'd better try to say a bit more. As the term is widely used, it seems to me to refer to three different things which are endlessly getting entangled together, but I think should be kept apart. There is paradigmatic modernity, derived from Max Weber's original abstract concepts, which represent an ideal type set of constructs which may or may not be realised anywhere. They're ideal types. They're not talking about the real world, they're talking about tendencies. Um, and his classic constructions of capitalism, bureaucracy, rationality, individuality, universality, and so on. Then there's what I'll call sociological modernity, which is based on Talcott Parsons' description of Western European society that had <coughs> come to exist in the 19th and 20th centuries, and which may or may not conform to the paradigm, and which anyway gets described by different sociologists in different ways depending on their own ideological proclivities. And then there's a sort of notion of globalised modernity, almost contemporaneity, which is simply what exists now in the spaces affected over the last 200 years by the globalisation of capitalism, as it in some ways is different from what existed before. It certainly uses the instruments of modernity as an instrumentalised rationality, but not necessarily towards the ends prescribed by Weber or Parsons. Globalised modernity allows for the possibilities of a great deal of variety and differentiation in the forms that modernity comes to take. And it's obviously the form of modernity that I'm talking about here. And so finally to politics. And here what interests me is the contrast between the strength and embeddedness of democratic institutions and processes in South India and what one might regard as their rather equivocal outcomes in terms of governance, welfare, and even social stability. I think that in India we often take democracy for granted and forget just how remarkable experience has been in comparison to the rest of the world. India is the only non-white British colony to have sustained a continuous tradition of democratic government, government since independence, which of course it achieved before any other. Indian democracy is remarkable and deeply embedded but why? Strikingly, very few of the general conditions anticipated by political science for democracy, culturally homogenous populations, strong frameworks of public administration, egalitarian or at least equal opportunity economies, and so on. very few of the conditions which a political science textbook would tell you are necessary for democracy actually existed in India or applied there. And famously, in the early 1960s, the political and social theorist Barrington Moore doubted that democracy would last. He thought it would collapse um, in the not too distant future. Yet not only has it lasted, but by any comparative standards, Indian democracy is very active, very participatory. Voter partition rates are remarkably high, and noticeably so among the poor and the minorities, who have sustained much higher voter rate participatory rates than the rich and the middle classes. 
Faith in the democratic process remains especially strong at the bottom of the social hierarchy. Equally, Indian democracy extends much beyond Lok Sabha and state assembly elections, which in some ways offer only five yearly opportunities to kick out the incumbent rascals. It embraces thousands of municipalities, Gram panchayats, village panchayats, where elections are held very regularly. It also reflects complex procedures of social engineering, aimed at including the, uh, gaining the inclusion of a broad swathe of society, low castes, religious and cultural minorities, and women, the, the latest uh, of the new political minorities. The commitment of the Indian states to expanding the formal procedures of democracy cannot, I think, be held in any doubt. Moreover, in the South, these procedures have been especially strongly developed and maintained. The voter participation rate at the last state assembly elections in Tamil Nadu and Kerala in May of this year was 76% and 78% respectively. The South, as I've already indicated, played the lead in developing backward caste reservations, and albeit in strict defiance of the letter of the Constitution, it, most of southern states extend them now to Muslims. It's been southern politicians too who have pressed ahead most keenly with the agenda of devolving power below the state level of government. The Karnataka politician Ram Krishna Hegde is widely credited with having pioneered the present panchayati system of devolved government. And Karnataka are widely regarded too as the state in which devolution is most deeply advanced. The current government of Kerala has taken matters even further. Nearly 40% of total state expenditures are now passed directly to panchayats, cutting out the intermediary levels of the world. And lying behind this, I think that one can see in some political discourse over a long period a special reverence for, if you like, the wisdom of the people, the right of the people to be heard and to govern themselves. Those sentiments informed the very strong movements in the 1950s demanding the reorganisation <coughs> of the states along linguistic lines so that the people should be heard and could be governed in their own languages. It also underlies the very obvious populism practiced by the great majority of southern parties. In his study of politics in Tamil Nadu, Narendra Subramanian argued that Tamil parties possess very decentered structures of authority, with followers in close contact with leaders, pressing them to meet particular demands, and leaders going out of their way to do so, competing as to who can meet these demands and claims the best. And I think that's true right across all the main parties in the other southern states too, often leading them into taking up particular causes which may be against their own better judgment and may even be physically unsustainable, as with the oscillating history of prohibition legislation, which responds especially to the demands of women's constituencies to have their men folk stop from drinking, um, but can't really be afforded by any Indian state for very long because liquor taxes is one of the very few ways that they're able to raise revenue of taxes. In informal organisation and procedural terms, then, the South is very seriously democratic. But that then poses even more strongly the issue of what its society actually gets out of this democracy, and how the latter actually works on the ground. In the first place, most modern prospectuses on democracy propose that the practice as at least a means of resolving conflicts, reducing what otherwise are assumed to be higher levels of social tension and violence, aiding social stability, aiding social cohesion. Again, if you look at a political science textbook, this is what democracy is supposed to do. However, it's certainly not clear in India generally, and very much not in the South, that this is necessarily so. These democratic practices are taking place in what is still an inherently riotous society and which shows few signs of quietening down. In their book, The Pursuit of Lakshmi, Suzanne and Lloyd Rudolph commented without further note that Indira Gandhi's emergency was called in a context where the annual number of police notified riots had risen to 80,000 in 1974, from a mere 33,000 in the normal times represented by 1965. Now, hold on a minute. Normal. 
30, good afternoon, 3,000 riots. And if anything, the numbers grow subsequently. In 2006, in Kerala, the police notified 6,458 riots. In Maharashtra, in the same year, they notified 7,443 riots. Nor, I think, is this riotousness adequately explained by Parthen Chatterjee's formula in his Politics of the Government, which um, ascribes this violence to the existence, in juxtaposition to an elitist civil society, a political society which is deeply alienated from an oppressive state. Certainly in the South, the great majority of riots are not aimed, at least in the first instance, against the state. They are aimed against other people, other members of the same society, communal riots, class riots, caste riots. Between, 19, between 2003 and 2008, there was a communal riot in Maharashtra every 20 days. Nor do they necessarily involve only the poor and the dispossessed. Indeed, very often riots are actually instigated by members of the upper castes and classes and members of the dominant religion in order to keep the poor and the dispossessed in their place. Chatterjee's rather romantic conception of an alternative political society responding to its supposed disenfranchisement with righteous violence seems to me really to have very little purchase here. Put simply, civil society in the South is both formally democratic and strongly riotous at the same time, and the two are related. A recent uh, study by Casey Vadlavanati has shown that the number of riots tends to go up as elections approach. 2006, for example, was an election year in both Kerala and Maharashtra. A second problem with Southern democratisation is that in spite of what I've just said about non-alienation from the state, the people really seem to get relatively little out of their governments, especially given that they seem to have such a strong influence on it, and even, in a broad, broad terms, participate in it. Now here we may need to be a bit cautious. I certainly think that more people in the South get rather more out of their governments than is the case elsewhere in India. Welfare provision tends to be more advanced and more efficiently administered than in other states. Um, Kerala's administration of the public distribution service, the distribution of food, for example, is, is near paradigm. And as I mentioned, it was Tamil who really invented the midday meal scheme. Also, public investment in certain forms of infrastructure, especially education and health, if not necessarily power and roads, has been strong for many years. Equally, again, as I mentioned, backward caste and other forms of protection, amelioration and advancement for minorities is much more highly developed than elsewhere. As Indian governance goes, this is about as good as it gets. But certainly from the perspective of any modernist agenda, there has to be the question of why it doesn't go much further. Why, given the strength of the democratic presence, so many other things appear to be off the political agenda? This is particularly so, with one noticeable exception, in regard to the radical redistribution of property which one might feel is remarkable given the very large number of very poor people, very poor voters, who are engaged in this politics. The exception would be, or might appear to be, Kerala, which under the governments of the Communist Party, uh, CPM, uh, did push through radical measures of land reform in the 1970s. However, that might be considered clearing up some of the mess left over from colonialism. Even in Kerala, the reforms were far from comprehensive, and large numbers of people were left out. And thereafter, nobody, including the Kerala communists, has been much concerned to carry the revolution on. And the so-called Dravidian parties, radical Dravidian parties in Tamil Nadu, popular Janata People's parties in Karnataka, dropped these issues from their agendas long, long time ago. The basic property structure of southern society now seems to be taken more or less for granted. Rather, as Marguerite Barnett observed the Tamil politics, the concern seems mainly focused on issues of relative uh, deprivation or underprivilege, which is to say the concern is for everybody to have access to or to share in privileges, the privilege of private property, the privilege of office and secure employment, the privilege of temple entry. 
That in practice is what the equality demanding so vociferously in populist rhetoric actually amounts to. Equality doesn't involve the abolition of privilege as such. Structural change to remove the underpinnings of privilege in the first place. And as a result, of course, it tends to make politics into a zero-sum game, sum game. For by definition, everybody cannot be privileged or privilege ceases to exist. Somebody has to be excluded or it isn't privileged. And the third set of issues raised by the political practices of the very democratic South is the role of taking governments by corruption and by charisma. <coughs> if democratisation is supposed to make government more accountable to the people, then the open and very corrupt flavour of corruption lying at the heart of Southern government <coughs> must be anomalous. And it is very open and very flagrant, and has appeared so for a very long time. I mean, in Tung Mug, um, MGR's original revolt against the DMK in 1977 was primed by his accusation that even by that time, uh, the party in office had become deeply corrupt. But it didn't take very long for the same accusations to be lodged against him and his own end DMK. And especially so since his takeover in 1987 by Jaya Lalita Jaya, who has probably faced more charges of corruption than any other politician in India. On the state of things today, those of you who read the Indian papers will undoubtedly be familiar with the doings of the notorious mining magnate Reddy Brothers in Andhra and Karakita. While sitting, sitting as ministers in the current BJP, um, Bharatya Janata Party led government in Karnataka, they've also been found by the Supreme Court to have developed a, a controlling influence over the Congress Party led government on the, over the other side of the border in Andhra Pradesh, which had legally granted the mining privileges. Indeed, at one point it's alleged they changed the official border between Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh in order to fit it better into their own industrial strategy. And so it goes on. The current governor of Karnataka has given permission for Yediyurappa, the chief minister, to be indicted on charges of land scanning. But with this in mind, and before the indictment came, Yediyurappa set up a commission of the Karnataka government, which has now charged practically all of his predecessors for the last 20 years with doing exactly the same, including S.M. Krishna, who is now India's foreign minister. And so it goes on. The whole fabric of southern government appears to be rotten with corruption. Now, if one were a cynic, one might agree with Edward Gibbon that this is simply the generic product of democracy, where, to quote Gibbon, corruption is the surest sign of constitutional government. But if one's politics are not weak, it calls for some explanation, an explanation particularly of its persistence, and why, in the end, Demos doesn't really seem to do much about it. By that, I don't mean that there's not a huge hue and cry, especially in the newspapers, whenever one of these corruption case breaks cover, and endless denunciations of the evils of corruption. But look who's leading the accusations, and what in the long term becomes of them. Just at present, there is a hue and cry concerning the behaviour of the DMK's former Union Minister of Telecoms, um, a Raja, who may be involved in a $40 billion telecom scam, and which has resulted in his DMK being turned out of office in the Tamil Nadu polls held in May. But who's leading the revolt? Who won the election? The cleansing angel of Tamil Nadu politics turns out to be none other than Jayalalita Jayaram, the AIA DMK's leader, who herself was once even suspended from being a chief minister on account of the corruption charges standing out against her. Corruption seems to be what your party opponents do, never what you actually do yourself. And in the long term, it doesn't seem to make much difference. Hardly anybody ever gets uh, convicted, and it's hard to think of a single political career which is ever been destroyed by it. Electorates may in the short term throw out one set of incumbent rascals in abhorrence of what they've been up to, but it's only to bring in another set who are already known to be just as rascally, and quite often these days they don't even bother. Indeed, as Narendra Subramanian showed with regard to Tamil Nadu, and as I think is equally true elsewhere, most voters don't even change the party that they vote for between different elections 
no matter what their party leaders have been doing. The, the bulk of vote banks are virtually hereditary and or caste based. And the percentage of floating votes, although often critical in determining outcomes, is actually very few. Now these facts, I think, have to be taken into account in explaining the depth and persistence of corruption in the South, which can't just be put down to the familiar failures and inadequacies of the institutions of law and governance, palpable though they are. But there's a strong sense in which acts of corruption, at least by one's own party or people, are normalised, tolerated and accepted. It's what politics, Rajniti if you prefer, is supposed to be about. And that, I think, reflects the extent to which that core element in paradigmatic modernity of the separation between the spheres of public right and private right has never really won much acceptance in Southern culture. It's one of those elements of modernity which, as I detected earlier, has just been eclectically ignored. One can see that again in the public discourse of caste reservations for state employment. Where employment by the state is seen as something to which different caste groups have a right and entitlement to share and possess, as if it was some kind of property uh, that they could possess. And not as something which is actually meant to serve the public, uh, the universalised people, as efficiently as possible. While then, uh, Southern society may have engaged very strongly in many features of modernity, it very much has not with this key basic idea the conception of the modern state, public-private distinction. But why not, and what's it put in its place? And secondly, there's a continuing, and one might say dominant role, played in southern politics by charisma, which has very much not become routinized as Weber's classic paradigm would anticipate. In a very recent book, Andrew Wyatt has looked at the role of what he terms political entrepreneurship in Commonwealth and the way that politicians come to manufacture and sustain their own political parties. And we all know about the roles long played by film stars in Tamil and Telugu politics, which have started creeping now into Karnataka too. The bonds and power of this charisma by uh, exercise or possessed by these leaders is quite extraordinary. When it was first announced in 1984 that MGR had a terminal illness, 22 of his supporters committed suicide, as it were on the spot. When he died in 1987, another 69 committed suicide. Couldn't live without him. In 2008, when V.S. Rajasekhar Reddy, V.S.R., was killed in a helicopter crash in Andhra, 32 people committed suicide in sympathy. And he wasn't even a film star. Following May's state election in Tamil Nadu, one supporter of the victorious Jayalalita cut off her thumb and another cut out her tongue by way of showing their gratitude to, uh, to the goddess Rita. More broadly, such charismatic figures are capable of inspiring a very high degree of trust in very large numbers of followers who look to them personally for welfare and protection, frequently blotting out recognition of the more dubious things that they may have been doing. In a way, politics becomes persuading or petitioning the leader to take one's case or cause, to act on one's behalf. Narendra Subramanian has talked about the highly paternalistic structure of political parties in Tamil Nadu, uh, but the same could be applied broadly across the South and even to the role that someone like the M.S. Nambudripak came to play within the Communist Party in Kerala. So there, then, for me, is the problematique represented by contemporary Southern politics advanced forms of formal democracy, but a politics not sparked by great social cohesion and stability, by sharper public accountability, by the universalisation of citizenship. Rather, one marked by continuing and perhaps intensifying riotousness, by a corruption which threatens to collapse public obligation into private entitlement, and by a personalisation of authority reflective of a persistent, non-routinised, charismatic leadership. How to account for this? How to explain it? Well, I'm a historian, so obviously my first inclination is always to turn to history. But in dealing, for example, with the question of the strength and embeddedness of the democratic tradition, I'm not too, or too sure that the available history uh, carries us very far. Familiarly, this would cite the importance of India's long 
largely peaceful struggle for freedom from colonial rule, whose mark is enshrined in a written constitution which has come to be imputed with an almost sacral value. As we saw after 1998, when the BJP proposed rewriting it and stirred up a hornet's nest, there's deep belief in the preservation of the Indian constitution. I certainly don't want to dispute that case at the All India level, nor to lose sight of the several factors in the structure of the Indian constitution which have reduced potential threats to democracy, most notably from the military. However, I'm not sure how far references here directly explain the way that democracy has come to be practiced, particularly in the South. Large parts of the region were never parts of British Congress India. They were in princely states where the freedom struggle came only late. Also, the key popular movements of the period, non-Brahminism and Dravidianism, were frequently oriented against the national freedom struggle and never ascribed a particularly high value to at least formal democracy since they were at times allied to colonial rule. A second historical source of Indian democracy has been seen, for example, by Stephen Wilkinson, and highly ironically, in the training supplied before independence by British constitutional devolution, in the legislative councils, municipal and local elections, and so on of the colonial era. But while these certainly enjoyed some response from local elite groups, they seem to me to have been so narrow and elitist and constrained that any educative role that they might have had for mass democracy was strictly limited. Rather, I think we may have to go back a lot further and also to recover what was the original purpose of the institution through which democracy has come to grow, namely Parliament. Parliaments, by origin, of course, represented forms of court where the um, very particular rights of citizens and subjects could be put to the test and publicly adjudicated. And South India has a very long tradition of its own of doing precisely that. And what I think is a seminal work on the nature of the pre-modern state, Frank Perlin pointed out the dualistic nature of right in Maharashtra. Now, pre-modern pre pre rights, of course, were highly particularistic, tied to particular people, tied to particular contexts. But importantly, they came from two different sources. Right partly came from the authority of kings and emperors above, but they also, and very importantly, came from the authority of community institutions beneath, where, for example, a primary claim to land came from connection to the ancestors who had cleared it in the first place, and from the services being supplied to the people who were living on it. And these rights were protected, defined, and adjudicated by various kinds of community organisations or bodies, Goga, uh, Nandus, Sabas, and so on. Now, these community rights were certainly under strain from the 16th century onwards, from the growth of superior early modern state formations and bureaucracies, such as the Mughal Empire. But the further south one goes, the weaker were these superior formations, and the stronger from the influence from the other side, the side of community-based rights. Indeed, in Cholanad and Tamana, and there's been a long debate among medievalists about whether, in fact, the area possessed fully constituted private property rights, independent of the state, as early as the 11th or 12th centuries. That seems to be anachronistic, and also to miss a key feature, that these rights were lodged inside corporate institutions. They were expressed as shares in them, not conceived as belonging to isolated individuals. And that position, in turn, is very important in two ways. First, in contributing to a particular kind of ideology of egalitarianism. Every village was conceptually divided into equal shares, 12th, 16th, 24th, implying the equal right of those who had settled it. Indeed, it was still widespread practice in the 18th century for physical parcels of land to be redistributed between the shareholders on a regular basis to even out differences in fertility and productivity. Now what seems to be interesting here is that certainly by the 18th century, even from the 16th century, commercialization and migration had created a considerable distance between theory and practice. Land rights were quite widely bought and sold. 
actual village resident residents often had no real caste or kinship connection to the original settlers. Shares had become differentially owned, with one family, say, having four sixteenths of the village and another family having one quarter of one sixteenth of the village. Nonetheless, the original conception of rights still held. They were all conceived to be equally shareholders. Possession of the uppermost, which came to be known as the Marazi right, was something shared collectively among the community of holders, regardless of how much they actually held it. But they all possessed it. They were all, in a sense, equal. But that right itself represented a privilege visibly those who did not possess it, who were the non Mirastars of the village, and usually had ambitions to become Mirastars, to share in that privilege. And second, the ideological construction clearly blended together what we might call public and private right. The collective community was seen to be the primary possessor of right, but those rights were then appropriated and shared between the constituent families who owned, and in fact often bought and sold them. Private and public were inextricably entangled. Well, I think you can see where I want to go with this. To suggest that these historical, if you like, medieval conceptions of right have a direct image carrying them into the political ideology of today, the modern or at least the contemporary in South India. And the connection is even more palpable in some of the other core institutions of Southern society, especially the Hindu temple, which as Karol and Arjuna Pagarai pointed out long ago, was perhaps the central public institution. The temple too functioned along the same conception of differential but shared rights in a corporate or community institution. Um, perhaps even more than with land rights, it also entangled the public and private together. Where, for example, when land was given to a temple and thereby gained tax immunity, it usually remained in the hands of the donor, even after it had become part of the temple's endowment. Moreover, the temple also contributed to the actual competitiveness and entrepreneurialism of southern society, in sharp juxtaposition to the status implied by the classical caste system. The status of different caste groups, different jantis, at any one time depended in practice on their standing in relation to the god, how they were allowed to participate in public rituals and ceremonies. And in practice, that in turn often turned on how much they could endow the god with material wealth. What this created was a dynamic system in which wealth could very directly enhance or diminish social status, creating strong religious imperatives to gain wealth, an ethic of accumulation, if you like. And also it created a context of intense contest between jantis to achieve this higher status, leading on to a high propensity for riotousness, as different claims were tested against each other, riots and contests frequently involving the South's distinctive colours to the right and past to the left hand. Indeed, the difficulty of settling these claims then led on to a further dimension that of kinship and charismatic authority. Who could speak for the god in deciding rival claims between the Jati's contesting position? Only another god, or a divine king. And the divine king showed his own authority in two ways. By protecting and lavishing gifts on his people, and by gloriously celebrating the gods in artifact and performance. Gift, welfare and performance were the tools of southern kingship. Sanjay Subramanian, David Shulman, and Narayana Rao argue in their symbols of substance. And again, I think you can see where I would go with this, the very parallel behaviour of charismatic political leaders today. The great MGR, probably the greatest of the South's charismatic leaders, acted out the kingly model almost in punctilious detail. What greater gift could a king uh, give his people than to feel every child every day at noon. And what greater celebration of gods and people could there be than the remarkable first world tumble thunder held in Madurai in 1980, when MGR rebuilt the medieval city in all its splendour with huge pageants and displays to reverence the most important goddess of the present, Mother Tumble. I think that if you read together symbols of substance, which deals with how to be a king in medieval India, and Andrew Wyatt's recent book, political entrepreneurship, 
and to be a political leader in contemporary time. You can't but be struck by the extraordinary paradox. So that what I'm suggesting is really a high degree of continuity between the political ideology and culture of, as it were, pre-modern southern society and what happens in the 3,000 local political leaders in South India today. But what then of the colonial intervention and even the radically new qualities supposedly represented by modernity? Well, obviously, I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which colonialism changed the configuration of institutions and the context within which southern society came to operate demanding that society kept ideas, especially the idea of the modern state, imported from Europe, and with the competitive pressures of a global industrial economic order. However, I do have doubts that it created a meaningful epistemic break, as post-colonial theorists would insist. We may be able, we may be inclined to overestimate colonialism's direct power, certainly as the vanguard agent of modernity with a capital X, uh, it was itself highly equivocal about modernity, wrapped by its own romantic, atavistic anchorings after a tradition. It also provided a very shallow state, both in its purposes and its personnel. What was actually fashioned may indeed have been different from what existed before, but really, it rarely came out as colonial authorities intended, if they knew what they intended, which often seems in doubt. For example, in much of the South, there was an attempt to break down the corporate nature of land rights with their qualified egalitarian implications in favour of individual rights, riot worry by riot by peasant. However, in some places, uh, like the Big River Delta Valley, it was politically resisted and ended up more or less being abandoned. In others, it merely led to the reformulation of old sentiments in new guises, where the attempted individualisation of land rights gave way rise to the formation of corporate dominant landholding castes. And this was most true, I would suggest, with regard to the temples, where the Christian British were very uncomfortable and where Indians may have got their first education in modern politics long before constitutional devolution began or the Indian National Congress was ever born. Forced to abandon the direct administration of temples in the 1840s, the colonial state, of course, tried to sustain its control indirectly via the courts and via Indian trustees, frequently organised into boards. But here it became heavily entangled with Indian agencies, which frequently slipped its leash. One of the principles of the colon that the colonial state tried to enforce was that of the basic separation between private and public right. In particular, that when a donor gave an endowment to the temple, it then belonged to the temple and not residually to him as well. However, during the 1890s, a huge furore was set up when it was discovered that Indian trustees, seemingly en masse, were, quote, embezzling temple funds and, quote, corruptly diverting the public resources of the temples to their own use. In effect, for 50 years, in spite of the colonial intervention, it had continued to be business as usual in the way temples were actually run. Then, or at least by the 1920s, when the state's supposed embargo on interference in religion and custom began to lift, new laws were passed to create new, modern means of running <coughs> the development boards to enforce modern conceptions of state authority. But whether they did or not, still <coughs> was a question, amidst continuing slews of corruption cases involving the so-called misuse of temple funds. And notably, when the DMK first gained full government power in 1967, one of the first things it did, even though at the time it claimed to be an atheist party, was to dismiss large numbers of incumbent temple trustees and then put its own nom nominees into the resulting vacancies, which clearly it saw as representing vital items of patronage, plus la chance. Also, of course, it was in relation to the temples the southern society often cut its teeth on strategies of mass political mobilisation and demand for what it meant by freedom. In the 1920s and 30s, the various campaigns run especially across Tamil Nadu and Kerala to gain temporal, temporal entry for members of the lowest castes frequently were bigger and more popular than campaigns strictly in support of the national movement, which tried to piggyback on them. Freedom and right were religiously conceived which again perhaps helps to account for the strength of the South's commitment to democracy 
especially among the lowest castes. And so where then does this leave us with this agenda of modernity? Well, perhaps somewhere between Bruno Latour, who famously doubted that the concept represented much more than the fantasy of late 19th century European sociologists, or at best the ideology of a hegemonic European bourgeoisie. And in this context, Susan and Lloyd Rudolph, who, if in rather different ways to me, argued that if modernity exists, South India's tradition seems remarkably congruent. But certainly I think that that original paradigm of modernity has to be treated with suspicion as representing a very inadequate projection of the world's necessary future outside Western Europe, and in the longer term, perhaps even there. I mean, the classic artefacts of that projection, organised capitalism, unionised labour, universal rights, the welfare state, bureaucratic rationalism, uh, secularism and so on, seem rarely to have realised themselves very far outside Western Europe, and in recent years to be fading away there too. I have some sympathy with theorists who would regard modernity as a particular historical phase and location in Western Europe, which is now passing as we move into deeper uh, current uncertainties of post-modernity. Although, whenever one inspects them, the manifestations of post-modernity also have a tendency to recall pre-modernity, religion, faith, community. Maybe it's better to sideline the paradigm altogether and think of the container in contemporaneous and more open terms as the product of the global, a highly particularistic interaction of different economies, different cultures, under the aegis of capitalism, which is at least somewhat easier to define. These interactions never take place on a tabula rasa. What's there before has to determine what is accepted and rejected, how novel constructions are founded and formed. History has its place. And looking at the world like that, I might come to the conclusion that it's South India's particular historical inheritance, which has both fitted it to thrive so strongly in the world of contemporary global capitalism and preserved so much from the past. Because we saw, of course, and as I mentioned right at the beginning, it's important to remember that the South isn't new to the logic of global commerce. It was one of the centres of medieval and early modern world trade and manufacture, the work workshop of the world uh, for a period. And many of its old social institutions and proclivities fit well with the demands of a latter-day capitalist order. The entrenchment of its ideas of property rights as the key to privilege its religiously legitimated ethic of wealth accumulation, its riotous social competitiveness, its preference for putting community loyalties ahead of those to an abstract universalist state. In some ways, if we wanted to design a social and cultural history to serve many of the needs of global capitalism as it's presently constituted, in many ways you couldn't write that history better than in terms of what's happened in South India. 